Okay folks, good evening. This is Geronami. Thank you very much for tuning to our channel today. Today I want to talk a few minutes about this uh, Sam Harris. He's, uh, he came up with this new book, Moral Landscape, How Science Can Determine Morality. And I want to take this argument today. Now, Sam Harris is uh, a neuroscientist and he thinks that morality can be determined by what happens in our mind by our experiences, human experience can determine our moral values. Human rationality, human experience in science and the knowledge we accumulate in science can all that is needed to do scientific uh, thinking and also to determine the moral thinking. You see, many times we do not get this point. You see, there are metaphysics in this world and science is one of the physical tools. Ultimately, if you look into the development of science, even science beginning with metaphysical assumption. For example, Francis Bacon, the deductive method, what did he say? Because God created the world. We can know for sure by our experience what he created. And our experience do not lie to us because God created us in a way that we can get the exact information from our experimentation. So that is the inductive method of Francis Bacon with the metaphysical foundation in God. Same with Descartes, with the directive method that human mind has the capacity to understand the world. And Descartes says, because human mind is a creation of God. So both inductive method of Francis Bacon and directive method of Descartes both had foundation in God. So you see, science itself is a derivative of Christian metaphysics. People like Sam Harris do not understand that. And he says these words, uh, he says that uh, um, physical reality alter it. You see, folks, even, I mean, our knowledge is very, very imperfect. We need to realize this the dimensions we have to life. For example, we are three-dimensional beings like uh, we're X, Y, Z axis. Those are spatial dimensions. But Einstein said there is a fourth dimension called time. So we have space-time today. And we have string theory today. I mean, so far we have a modern physics, the, like a classical physics in one realm. There is a quantum mechanics in the other realm. And uh, some of these laws that apply in classical physics are not applicable in quantum mechanics. To avoid this uh, bifurcation, physicists are coming up with the string theory. And string theorists are saying there are up to nine different dimensions to reality. So the dimensions to physical reality are increasing. And people like Sam Harris are not uh, realizing that. There are so many dimensions to physical reality. Uh, my point is uh, we don't have complete understanding of even our physical existence. And atheists are saying there is no spiritual dimension to human life. I mean, think of the irrationality of that. All the physical laws that bind the universe are actually immaterial. I mean, they exist. It's like E equals to MC square, Albert Einstein's famous equation. Now, E equals to MC square, there is no atomic structure to E equals to MC square. And that law is true wherever you go in the universe. The law is true. The law has an existence, but it does not have an atomic structure. In that sense, the physical laws are like a spiritual laws because they are immaterial, even though they have an existence. The same applies here. God is a spirit, the Bible tells us in John chapter 4, verse 24. And then Sam Harris goes on to say that uh, uh, to go to Africa and to help the people who are in starvation and disease, you don't need Christianity. And atheists can do that also. But yes, I, I agree. Atheists can do a lot of good things. Atheists can do uh, philanthropic work. But if you take 100 Christians and 100 atheists and 100 Hindus or 100 Buddhists and 100 Muslims, 
Christians are more likely to go to Africa and help people in starvation and facing the threat of extinction. Because in Christianity it says human beings are created in the image of God. In atheism there is no such a thing. Human being is just another animal. I mean, even if you, even, even in the whole Africa goes for extinction, it's a very, very minute event in the big history of the universe. And especially Richard Dawkins was actually very honest in that area. Let me quote a passage of uh, Richard Dawkins from his book, River Out of Eden, A Darwinian View of Life. And listen to what he says. He says this, the total amount of suffering per year in the natural world is beyond all decent contemplation. During the minute that it takes me to compose this sentence, thousands of animals are being eaten alive. Many others are running for their lives, whimpering with fear. Others are slowly being devoured from within by rasping parasites. Thousands of all kinds are dying of starvation, thirst and disease. It must be so. If there ever is a time of plenty, this very fact will automatically lead to an increase in the population until the natural state of starvation and misery is restored. In a universe of electrons and selfish genes, blind physical forces and genetic replication, some people are going to get hurt, other people are going to get lucky, and you you won't find any rhyme or reason in it, nor any justice. The universe that we observe has precisely the properties we should expect. If there is at bottom no design, no purpose, no evil, no good, nothing but pitiless indifference." And so Richard Dawkins, what is he saying? He is saying that if there is plenty today, tomorrow there might be starvation. That's just the reality. And he is saying some people are, are lucky, some people are uh, are not lucky. I mean, if you have iMacs and iPhones and iPads and a lot of food and you have credit card to go to McDonald's and pick up all the food you could eat, you are just lucky to have those things. And if you are in some uh, part of the world where there is lack of food and there is so much starvation, forget about iPhones, iPads, you don't have a morsel of food to fill your stomach, that's you are unlucky. There is no difference between the two in the cosmic things. But that's what Richard Dawkins goes on to say. He says, the universe that we observe has precisely the properties we should expect if there is at bottom no design, no purpose, no evil, no good, nothing but pitiless indifference. So atheism, in the atheistic worldview, you could do good things to other human beings, but there is no justification. Whether you go to Africa to serve the poor or whether you lie in the beach under the sun and read uh, some book on your Kindle, it makes no difference in the cosmic sense. But in Christianity, human beings are created in the image of God. And that's a very, very powerful truth, folks. Let me tell you other thing also. I mean, even when you do not uh, uh, have empirical evidence for the existence of God, conceptually, to lead in a morally objective life. Conceptually, you need to start with God. And at this juncture, I want to talk a few minutes about Immanuel Kant, perhaps the most important philosopher in Western philosophy. You see, the three important things, human mind to have access to knowledge, then human will to have good ethics, and then human sensibility to have aesthetics. So human knowledge, human ethics, and human aesthetics. The human mind that is determining human knowledge, the human will that is determining the ethics, and the human sensibility that determine aesthetics. Now, Immanuel Kant wrote three very important books, Critic of Pure Reason, Critic of Practical Reason, and Critic of Judgment. So, Critic of Pure Reason, he says that the human mind has access to knowledge. In Critic of Practical Reason, he says human will determines the ethics. And then in the Critic of Judgment, he says human sensibility determines aesthetics. But in all three volumes, he starts with God. In Critic of Purism, he starts with God because God is the first cause. And there we determine 
what is to be trusted. It's the same, same route Descartes has taken uh, previously. And in the Critica for Practical Reason, he says that uh, human will determines ethics, but absolute values do not exist without God. Then in Critica for Judgment, where human sensitivity, sensibility determines uh, aesthetics, he also starts with God. You see, in all three areas, he starts with God, because without God, there are no absolute moral values. And without more absolute moral values, you cannot say what is good and what is evil. So atheism doesn't make sense, and science does not determine absolute moral values. Go back to Second World War, when they were uh, doing experiments on infants, Jewish infants they took, like the scientists like Joseph Mangala were doing these experiments all in the name of science. What happened? They believed that morality could be extracted from science and the reason and the philosophy without any religious, without any Christian outlook. They put away the Christian outlook in, uh, in Germany under Hitler's regime, but human beings are created in the image of God. That's their religious teaching. It does not come from science or philosophy or reason. Go back to Aristotle, folks. In politics, he actually defends slavery. He, de he defends infanticide. So you see the human essence and the human significance is a Judeo-Christian teaching. That's why you find more Christians going to Africa or more Christians going to India. When Mother Teresa went to India uh, to start her uh, philanthropic activities in Calcutta, some of the hardline Hindus said it is their karma. Let them go. Mother Teresa, stop these good things you are doing to these people because that's their karma. That's why they are poor. That's why they are dying. That's why they are starving. But Mother Teresa said, because Jesus taught me to help the poor people, I came to India. That's the difference between uh, Christianity and other worldviews, folks, that God has created us in, the, in his image. So morality is a metaphysical uh, concept. Science is a physical concept. So science, which is a physical tool, cannot determine the metaphysical concepts like morality. So those are two different domains. But people like Sam Harris are combining them too, and that is not good for the human society because that is actually impossible because a physical tool cannot determine uh, the metaphysical concept like morality. But the good news is that God has spoken. The Bible says, For God so loved the world that he gave his begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. God so loved the world. That's, that's the gospel, folks. Our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, he died for our sins. And when he died for our sins, he did not stay on the cross. He was buried and rose again the third day from the dead. And today, Jesus Christ is a living Savior who gives us hope. And by his great commission, people went around the world. You see, Jesus' method is simple. He changes our hearts and minds so that we could love people because they are created in the image of God. When we love people, we serve people. That is the Christian concept of philanthropy. Atheism, of course, can do philanthropic activities, but there is no rational justification for why an atheist must help other human beings. That's for today's take on this important book from Sam Harris. And uh, that's a very important concept that morality could come from science. I mean, the tragic thing about today's science is a lot of people are uh, forgetting the limitations of science and they're uh, thinking that uh, everything that is important in human life could be determined by science, even morality. And that's tragic because every good scientist has to realize that there are limitations to science. And if you just worship at the altar of science, then that becomes a religion itself. And that's called a scientism, and it is not real science. And science and morality are two different spheres, and please do not try to combine them. That's Geronimo's take for today. Thank you very much. God bless you.